Welcome to our 63rd episode of Two Tankers and a Cat. We're your host, I'm Charlie. And this is Russell. Well, Russell, I'll tell you this. It's good to be back. Uh, my tooth is repaired, so I don't whistle while I talk. <laughs> That's always a good thing. And, and I apologize for missing uh, episode 62. 62. Yep. But uh, it is what it is. Yep. Um, today we are going to be talking about one of our most requested tanks. Uh, what is the correct pronunciation, Russell? Yeah, we've got some help from Craig on this one. Yeah, Craig um, Moore. We'll add that into the podcast to what he told us about. A little yeah. bit about this tank. It's the Sturm Panzer Wagon. Va- wagon. Yeah. W's or V's or V's something like in German, yeah. The A7V. Hi, guys. Um, just heard on your latest uh, podcast that you're going to be doing the World War One German tank. A big mistake is that it's called the A7V. Um, it's called the Sturm Panzer Wagen. Sturm, as in Sturmgesalz, that means assault. Sturm Panzer Wagen on an A7V chassis. They built the chassis and they did uh, different things with it. One was a supply vehicle, which is the Uberland Wagen. Uh, another one was a Flak Panzer on an A7V chassis. Just try and make that uh, point when you do your um, next podcast. Um, see you guys. Now, from what I understand, the A7V is just the chassis. Yes. And the metal and stuff they put on yes. turned out to be the Sturm Panzer Wagen. But we'll get yeah, more into yeah, that. Yeah. And we uh, really do appreciate Craig pointing that out to us before we got this put together. So, and uh, what, great, great guy. I mean, you, oh man, you can't you can't no, do better than he no. is. Yeah, it's, and uh, we're we're gonna try to put some snippets on this yeah. episode of uh, Craig talking because when you hear his voice, oh, it's great. You know, you, you just want to <laughs> sit down and have a cup of tea and listen. <laughs> You know, I, I hope one, one day that he actually does like, uh, books on tape, you know, yeah. that stuff you read. Yeah. So when I'm driving down the road, Heck I can just yeah. listen to him. Yeah. How cool would that be? I'd buy it. Now, before we start, I want to remind our listeners that we are getting a small part of our episodes, uh, information from like the books and this particular episode uh, we used, uh, I used, uh, Craig Moore's, uh, book called the tank hunter. And like we said, he's been an amazing friend to the show, but remember our episodes are meant to get you the listener to buy a book, to crack a book, to do your own research. Uh, Craig has some new books out there and is a true historian and he needs your support by buying his books. So you can Buy his book, uh, uh, research it yourself, and have it for reference. Um, you can get his stuff on Amazon. Amazon.com, yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, it's pretty simple. It is. And they'll ship it right to your front door. And we're liable maybe to put a link. Oh, that's a genius idea. Okay, so one of the main reasons we haven't jumped on this uh, A7V um, Sturm Panzer wagon is because... Craig is the man. Yeah. And we know he listens to the show and, and we're like, we're going to have to say, I know you are not getting everything that you need to know about this tank. Exactly. So uh, Russell, <laughs> let's jump off and tell us a little bit about this. In 1916, both the British and French introduced tanks on the battlefield and gradually improved their performances and design through frontline experience. But still, even by 1917, the German high command still considered they could be defeated by using special rifle bullets and artillery, in direct or indirect fire. The impression that they had was mixed, seeing their breakdowns and apparent difficult crossing of the heavily cratered no man's land. But the psychology effect on an unprepared infantry was such that this new weapon had to be seriously taken into consideration. The traditional view still prevailed, seeing infantry as the most versatile way to make a breakthrough, notably the famous elite assault squads, or Sturmtruppen, equipped with grenades, small arms, and flamethrowers. 
They proved successful during the spring offensive and further hampered the need for a tank. Despite initial resistance against tanks, their first shocking appearance on the battlefield in the fall of 1916 led in September of the same year to the creation of a study department. This department was responsible for all the information gathering on Allied tanks and for formulating both anti-tank tactics and devices and specifications for a possible indigenous design. Based on these specifications, the first plans were drawn by Joseph Vollmer, a reserve captain and engineer. These specifications included a top weight of 30 tons, use of the available Austrian Holt chassis, ability to cross ditches 1.5 meters or 4.92 feet wide, to have a speed of at least 12 kilometers per hour or 7.45 miles per hour, uh, several machine guns, and a rapid-fire gun. The chassis was also to be used for cargo and troop carriers, the first prototype built by Daimler, Motoring Gesellschaft, made its first trials on April 30, 1917 at Balen Marienfield. The final prototype was ready by May of 1917. It was unarmored, but filled with 10 tons of ballast to simulate the weight. After successful trials in Mainz, the design was modified once more to incorporate two more machine guns and a better observation post. Pre-production started in September 1917. Production started in October with an initial order of 100 units, and a training unit was formed in the process. By then, this machine was known after its study and department, the 7 Ebelung Brickenweisen, or the A7V. The Sturmpanzer Kraftwagen, meaning assault armored motor vehicle. So the high command was really resistant to start their own tank program until the allies let loose theirs. And then all of a sudden they start screaming, oh, we need a hundred of these things. One of the things that I like to point out is in modern weapons, or let's even go back then. When your troops are on the front line and they're like the British and the French and the Americans have these tanks and, and they're coming and our guys are literally freaking out. Now the German high command generals were like, Oh no, no, no. When we spot them, just simply have artillery, knock them out, which is tactically proven, Yeah, but they're forgetting about the guy in the trench. Yeah, they're, they're watching it come and they're freaking out that this big metal monster running towards them. If your ground troops look at you and say, we need to have this, you better start moving on it right then and there. Exactly. When the A7V was first introduced in the two first operational units, Assault Tanks Units 1 and 2, it had already revealed some flaws, notably the relatively thin underbelly and roof, at 10 millimeter armor, or 0.39 inches, not able to resist fragmentation grenades. The overall use of regular steel and not an armored compound, for production reasons, meant that the effectiveness of the 30 to 20 millimeter plating was reduced. Like contemporary tanks, it was vulnerable to artillery fire. It was overcrowded, with 17 men and an officer, the crew comprised of a driver, a mechanic, a mechanic slash signaler, and 12 infantrymen, gun servants, and machine gun servants, which included six loaders and six gunners. Of course, the restricted interior wasn't compartmented. The engine was situated right in the center, diffusing its noise and toxic fumes. That sounds kind of familiar to the tank we've already. Yeah. Covered. <laughs> Unfortunately, a yeah, couple of tanks exactly, that we already covered. Yeah. yeah. There's there's another thing that should have hit them. Yeah. The guys in the tank, the the ground forces, are coming out. They're choking. They're coughing. Some are passing out. Maybe put on a muffler. You know, it, blow the exhaust outside. Yeah, blow it outside instead of. Keeping it inside, maybe? Yeah, they're like, well, you know, we'd have to make another hole. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. 
When you're driving down yeah. the road and it kills your own troops, maybe you need another Holt. Uh, yeah. The Holt track, using vertical springs, was hampered by the overall weight of the tall structure, and its very low ground clearance and large overhang at the front meant very poor crossing capabilities on a heavily cratered and muddy terrain. With this limitation in mind, these first two units, ten tanks each, were deployed on relatively flat grounds. The amount of ammunition carried was considerable, further reducing the internal space. Around 50 to 60 cartridge belts, each with 250 bullets, plus 180 rounds for the main gun, split between special HE explosive rounds, canisters, and regular rounds. In operation, more shells were loaded, up to 300. During operations, a single tank was converted as a female with two Maxim machine guns replacing the main gun. As initially, no engine was powerful enough to move the 30 tons of the A7V in the restricted allocated space. Two Daimler petrol four-cylinder engines, each delivering about 100 horsepower, were coupled together. This solution produced the most powerful tank of the war, with a speed even greater than British light tanks, including the Mark V. 500 liters of fuel were stored to feed this engine, but due to the enormous consumption, the range never exceeded 60 kilometers on the road. Top speed off-road was limited to about 5 kilometers per hour, or 3.1 miles per hour at best. Uh, The driver had very poor vision, the A7V was committed mostly on open terrains and roads, just like armored cars, where its speed and armament could reveal its true potential. Last but not least, the A7Vs were all hand-built and of great manufacturing quality and very high cost. Every model had unique features as no standardization was achieved. Okay. I'm not making fun of the Germans. You know, our podcast uh, has ratings of one up huge in Germany. And uh, we're not slamming you. No. But uh, you got to start somewhere. uh, Right. But typical German, they're high quality. Yeah. They're hand built, quality manufacturing. And when you add all that up, that's a ton of money. Yeah. You know, it's totally German. It is. And totally inefficient for wartime manufacturing. Uh, It sounds like some people never learn. You know, like we had the American Shermans. We were printing them out like paper. Uh, The Soviet Union was kicking out, you know, their tanks. Yeah. Uh, You know, what, they produce one Tiger tank compared to 50 of ours. I know. Or, Or the... T-34s. Yep. Russell, tell me about when it got its first combat, you know, and what were the results of that combat? The first five squads of A-7Vs from the first assault tank unit were ready by March 1918. It was led by Hompton Grief. This unit was deployed during the attack on the St. Quentin Canal, part of the German Spring Offensive. Two broke down, but successfully repelled a localized British counterattack. On April 24, 1918, however, during the second battle of villers Bretonneau, three A-7Vs leading an infantry attack met three British Mark IVs, a male and two females. As the two females, damaged, were unsuccessful in damaging the German tanks with their machine guns, they withdrew and left the leading male dealing with the leading A7V in what was to become the first tank-to-tank duel in history. However, after three successful hits, the A7V was knocked out, and the crew, with five dead and several casualties, promptly bailed out. So the very first tank battle was one of these mobile fortresses and and a British Mark IV Male tank. Male tank. Can you imagine oh. just sitting there blasting each other? Man. Uh, it, it, it would have been neat. 
it would have been kind of neat to. <laughs> Again, but we do not glamorize no, war, and you know no. there were men killed. But we're talking history here. That that's the part that I think right. Neat going back to that. To be a time scene, traveler yeah. and to look back yeah. with no worries and no fear, yeah. armchair quarterbacking, and, and seeing them fight it out. The first tank battle, yeah. That that would have been great. That would have been amazing. The disabled tank was recovered and repaired later. The victorious Mark IV roamed the German lines, creating havoc, and was joined later by several whippets. But after the murderous mortar fire, this attack was stopped in its tracks. Three whippets were destroyed, as well as the Mark IV. This attack included all available A7Vs, but some broke down. Others toppled into holes and were captured by British and Australian troops. The entire attack was deemed a failure, and the A7V removed from active service. The 100 machines ordered was canceled, and several were scrapped in November. There's a good point. They had their first tank-to-tank battle, Mm -hmm. and they lost. Yeah. And and two of them had broke down, like you were saying. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the Mark IV being the breakthrough tank, brought in the you know whippets or what we were talking about yeah and, and and they're in there pushing through the lines tearing them up but then german command says oh let's use our mortars and tear them up and they did destroy sure. the mark four or a couple yeah. of whippets and yeah pushed them back so the germans tactically and strategically were correct yeah when you get these things slow moving out there your artillery, mortar fire, whatever. Yeah. Um, a a kinda, simple guy running up that had yeah. the guts to throw a grenade in. Kind of to show my age, it reminds you of the Duck Hunter game on Atari. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it really does. <laughs> so. But as slow as these things probably were. Yep. Yeah, you know. You know just, 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 yeah. But the Germans, high command, was like, no, we can kill these. We don't need them. Huge mistake. Yeah. Instead of having these field tri- trials, finding out why it broke down, improving, you know, what it needed to be improved. Yeah. Because the British didn't stop theirs. The Allies didn't stop theirs. Nope. They were like, okay, we saw what happened. We're going we're to start making, you know, design changes and stuff. Yeah. And who won the war? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's, let's go on, Russ. I'm sorry. I... The commitment of all available tanks with poor results increased the resistance from the German high command. Some successes were achieved by the most numerous German tank in service during the spring offensive, the Butte Panzer Mark IV and V. Almost 50 captured British Mark IVs or Vs were pressed into service under German markings and camouflage. They showed the advantage of full-length tracks over difficult terrains, They influenced, along with the few captured Whippets Mark A light tanks, the design of a new enhanced model, the A7VU. The U stands for Umlaufend Ketten, or full-length tracks, a German-made but British-looking rhomboid tank. Uh, Did you hear the meow? Oh, Skylar. That's, That's one of the other cats. That's not even our mascot. She's probably sleeping today, but... Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, that's, that's part of the, the <laughs> yeah. nuance of our uh, show is that we have cats come out and oh, I know. pay attention. Actually, with Lightning, um, she's only one of three cats that live here in this under this roof. So, yeah, the other two got one that's real vocal and one that's fat and lazy. Kind of like me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I wanted to comment, you know. Here's the German high command going, nope, nope, we're not going to do it. We're not going to do it. But they see the British Mark IVs and V, and they just repaint them and say, okay, the grunts on the ground say, fine. If you're not going to build these things and you're not going to help us out, we're going to take what we get and we're going to turn it around and put it back at them. 
And what's funny is if you look at World War II, they did the same thing. Exactly. They yeah. grabbed T-34s. Yeah. They grabbed Shermans. They grabbed whatever yeah. they could. They did. The guys in the field repainted them and yeah. put German markings on them and said, head them out. Use what they get. That, they get that, fun, yeah. that tells you something. You know, when the American Army goes forward into stuff, we'll, we'll press other tanks into service for right then and there. Yeah. You know, uh, like the American tiger two or King tiger tank that Mm -hmm. we took, we weren't actually going to use that in combats as such. Yeah. We were using it to move people down the road. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, uh, yeah, I guess that what I'm trying to say is if your ground troops are grabbing the other guy's, Guns, maybe they have better guns. Yeah, you know, it, I can it, see that. If they're grabbing their equipment, maybe their equipment's better. Maybe you need to look yeah. and, and see what's going on. So tell us a little bit more about this A seven A seven V dash U. You were saying it featured two fifty seven millimeter or two point two four inch guns in sponsons, and had a tall observation post similar to the A seven V. Although the prototype was ready by June of 1918, this 40-ton monster proved to have a high center of gravity and poor maneuverability. However, 20 were ordered in September. None were completed by the armistice. All other paper projects, mock-ups, and prototypes of the light LK-1 and 2 also laid unfinished in November of 1918. So they started building their own light tanks also. Yeah. But by that time, it was too late. It was too late, yeah. Starting late in the war, the Germans never had the opportunity to fully develop their tank arm, both tactically and technically. This was achieved clandestinely, but successfully during the 20s and early 30s. Nevertheless, this early and deceiving attempt was a landmark in German development. So... Russell, how did this, you know, Sturm Panzer Wagen actually get the name The Moving Fortress? Well, during World War I, it was nicknamed by the British The Moving Fortress. Big, tall, and symmetrical, with sloped armor, surprisingly fast, bristling with machine guns. It was, a de- it was indeed more akin to a moving fortification than a real tank. So, in other words, a fort on a set of tracks. All right. As it was basically an armored box based on the Holt chassis, its crossing abilities were far from equal to the contemporary British Mark IV or V. With only 20 built of the 100 initially ordered, it was more a propaganda tool than an effective breakthrough apparatus. You know, we talk about uh, propaganda and how important it is. And, and anybody says, oh, propaganda is not that big a oh, deal. Oh, man. I'm like. You've got whole units of armies. That, that specialize. They specialize in, in propaganda. In yeah. You know, if anything that we've learned, and the Americans did, yeah. was the propaganda that Germany had used and Ital- the Italians. Sure, Propaganda is an important part oh, it is. of everything. It is. So when your people are lined up to see like a military parade, like we do our air shows here yeah. in the United States, yeah, they see these big mobile fortresses and the guys, the young men that are coming up are looking at these things and say, I want to drive one of those. Sure. You know, when you go to an air show as a kid, you don't yeah. look at it and go, you know, I'd really like to work in the company that made those tires. <laughs> Most kids yeah, want to go, yeah. hey, I want to work. Fly the damn thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, Russ, you have explained in the past how the Americans named their tanks by their company letter. Being the first letter of the name of the tank, like in, like if it was company F, the tank would be called Fury because you know, it starts with an F. How did the A7V crews name their tanks all a7b's were christened by their crews the nicks eh, for example took part in the famous duel at villers bretonneau 
In March of 1918, Mephisto was captured on the same day by Australian troops. It is now displayed at the Brisbane Anzac Museum. We need that. Oh, I know. We'll talk about that here in a second. Other tanks were named Gretchen, Faust, Schnook, Baden One, Mephisto, Cyclop, Imperator, Siegfried, Alter Fritz, Laudi, Hagen, Nix Two, Heiland, Elfriede, Boule, Aldebart, Nixe, Hercules, Wotan, and Prince Oscar. I, I know our German listeners oh, right now are Lord. going, oh my God, Russ, you I butchered that. I did not take German. German in school at all. Didn't you take Spanish? Spanish, yeah. Yeah, we've talked about his yeah. Spanish class uh, going to France. Oh, man. I'm like, but what? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> awesome stuff, but you know I'm a quick stats guy. So give me the rundown of the actual tank. You know, I like to hear just the stats. It was in service on March 21st of 1918 to October 16th of 1918, and it was used by the German Empire during World War I. It was designed by Joseph Vollmer, designed in 1916, and manufactured by Daimler Motor and Gesellschaft. There were 20 of them built. They weighed about 32 long ton or 36 short ton. And that was the battle weight. The length was 7.34 meters or 24 foot 1 inch. That's a long time. Yeah, it is. The width about 3.1 meters or 10 foot 2 inches wide. It was about 3.3 meters or 10 foot 10 inches high. <laughs> That's taller uh, yeah. than my lead. Uh, it what is. The hell? It is, yeah. It had a minimum crew of about 18. 18 guys. I know. Mm. And, and they're sitting there with the engines running yeah. and the exhaust blowing right in their face. Coughing to death. It had armor of about 5 to 30 millimeters or 0. 0.20 inches to 1.18 inches thick. It's good against you know, oh, rifle yeah. rounds. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The main armament was a 57 millimeter gun initially with about 180 rounds and later they... Piled in about 300 rounds of that. The secondary armament was six 7.9 millimeter machine guns. Talk about rolling Man. fortress for moving fortress. Yeah. And they carried about 36,000 rounds of the machine Holy gun ammo. Smokes. It had two Daimler Benz four cylinder engines. It cranked out about 200 horsepower total. Had a power to weight ratio of 6.5 horsepower per ton. Still made it the it fastest did. tank yeah, out there. I know. The transmission was an Adler. The transmission uh, was an Adler gearboxes and differential style transmission. And it had a Holt track and vertical spring suspension. The operational range was about 30 kilometers or 19 miles over rough terrain. Or about 80 kilometers or 50 miles over the open road. The maximum speed was about 15 kilometers per hour or 9.3 miles per hour on the road and 6.4 kilometers per hour or 4 miles per hour cross country. Well, you know what? It's the fastest. It's the most well-built and most expensive. It sounds like a German Uh, car. uh, Yeah. (laughs) Before we go on to our second point, I wanted to bring up a message that we got. I guess we got an email from uh, Anna Karen Aerosmith. And uh, she wrote us a letter. And I guess it's her husband, Jeffrey Aerosmith. Yeah. He listens to our show, but he has a vision impairment. Yeah. And uh, he has Google at home. Yeah. Well, there's a phrase that I've used several times in, in past episodes yeah. of H-E-Y, Google, mm-hmm. do this or something like that. Yeah. Well, apparently, uh, like he said, uh, Jeff has got some vision problems. And when I say that, it shuts off the podcast. Oh, no. Yeah, so uh, we apologize to Jeff. Yes. You, you're amazing. Sorry. And, and Anna, big shout out to yes. you. But she said something that just drove me nuts. She said, uh, by the way, you were wrong. The comet was a good tank. I take that as a challenge. 
I will do an episode, and I will tell you exactly. We're going to do an episode on the Comet Tank, and I'm actually going to get Craig Moore and uh, uh, Francis Pullman and some of the other guys. I'm just going to send them little messages. Hey, on this Comet Tank, it was kind of junk. Um, I, I'm not saying it didn't look cool. It did look cool, but I think our next episode, uh, I'll just give you know uh, yeah. Craig a little heads up. Hey. Tell me why this uh, Comet Tank wasn't as good as, you know, let's say some of the others that were in mass production. <laughs> that way. And Jeff, know. thanks for, thanks Listen. for listening, man. That makes, yeah. Yep. It's folks like you that makes this show a success. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'm sure uh, Anna will go to New Zealand and meet Tony's oh, wife yeah. and they'll both come over here yeah. and beat me with rolling pins hey. now. <laughs> I'll even buy the rolling pin for you. To. Oh, see, <laughs> see, ladies and gentlemen, that's my buddy. That's my buddy. And then we'll charge admission for the show. Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, we're going to do a little something different on our second point. And people are going to go, well, what are you talking about? Our second point is the Queen's, Queenland's Museum in Brisbane. Uh, I want to talk about their uh, Anzac uh, Legacy Gallery. Uh, apparently... Like we said, and you're going to get more into it, but uh, they, the Australians got one of the, you know, stern pans, panzer wagons, and I guess it was outside for a long time. And then back in 2011, supposedly, or I'm not supposedly, but yeah. there was a flood that actually damaged it. And the people were like, Hey, this is a really important, this is the only one in the world we need to. Yeah, you know, clean it up, knock the rust mm. off, get it all up, and put in our gallery. Yeah. So now they've redone this entire museum, and I think that's what number two or number three on our bucket list. Oh man, to yeah, that's, get over to yeah, we'll fl- fly by New Zealand. We'll pick up Tony. Yeah. Then we'll fly over to Brisbane, and we'll go see. Like this amazing tank that yeah. we've seen, wanted to see for a Man. long time. Since it's on our bucket list, let's talk a little bit about the museum. Tell us a little something about how they got their tank and, and about the museum. The Villers Bretonneau, a small French village that was recaptured by the Australians at the cost of about 1,200 lives. Uh, the A7Vs were involved in the first tank versus tank action, as we'd already talked about. Right. The tank was named the Mephisto by its crew, and this 30-ton tank was part of an advance toward the French town of Amiens, resulting in the capture of villers Bretonneau and the temporary retreat of Allied forces. During the battle, Mephisto became stuck in a shell crater and was abandoned by its crew. It remained on the battlefield for months before troops of the 26th Battalion, AIF, composed mainly of Queenslanders, regained lost ground and retrieved it dragging the tank behind Australian lines under the cover of darkness. You got to love the Australians. Oh, man. <laughs> you know, and, and you see oh. that it's from Queensland. Yes. So the Australians, 1,200 men died to this. We're yeah. not making fun of that. No. These are heroes that did what they thought they had to yes. do. Yes, yes. Um, they, but they went in and they captured it, and at night when the command staffs know, they drug they drug this Man. thing back behind their lines. Okay, keep going, Russ. I'm sorry. It was sent to Australia as a war trophy, arriving at Norman Wharf in June of 1919, where it was towed by two Brisbane City Council steamrollers to the Queensland Museum, then located in Fortitude Valley. It remains the sole surviving A7V tank in the world. I'm I'm just loving this. Oh man! So they run over, you know, yeah. and you know why they did it at night. They're like, well, sure. Um, well, it'll protect against shelling yeah, and stuff. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I wish I was a fly on the wall because uh, you know the Australians were just sitting around, you know, drinking a beer, you know, having a good time, and they're like, you know what? What if we stole that <laughs> and shift it back to our hometown? They're like, yeah, that's a great idea. So they get it, yeah. and they actually pack it on one of their boats, 
there had to be some severe oh, planning on this. Man. That's why I want to go and research this so much. Thirty tons. I mean, yeah. that's. I, I mean, <laughs> I'm sure that you know, if I was in uh, you know war yeah. and I, I had a chance to come across foreign money, because I've brought you foreign money yeah. from where I've traveled, and sure. you've brought me money back. Yeah. You know, I, I enjoy handing out money. Yeah. To my friends and stuff saying, uh-huh. hey, while I was there, I thought, yeah, here's, you know, a $2 bill or, you know, a 50 cent piece. Yeah. <laughs> These guys <laughs> grab a 30 ton tank and ship it back. Eventually, Mephisto was shipped to Brisbane and preserved at Queensland Museum and displayed now at the Anzac Legacy Gallery. Well, I know that the museum is open, uh, you know, with all the COVID, but I think they're, you know, everything's starting to unlock yeah, a little bit. Yeah. And I've noticed that here in some of the museums in the United States. Yeah, that some of ours at, are opening you know. up. Um, I think they're still pretty restricted in the UK, but, you know, yeah. United States, we're probably not the best at preventing pandemics. I know. If we ever had something really severe, yeah. I think it'd be really bad. I know. But I know that the museum is open and located at the corner of Gray and Melbourne Street in South Brisbane, because I've been researching our trip over there. Uh, Brisbane is the capital at Queensland, is a large city on the Brisbane River, uh, clustered in its south bank, uh, culturally precinct, are the Queensland's Museum and uh, Science Center uh, with noted interactive exhibitions. Uh, another South Bank uh, cultural institution in Queensland Gallery of Modern Art, among Australia's major contemporary art museums, looming over the city, uh, they have uh, like the Brisbane Botan- Botanical Gardens, which would be amazing to go see. Yeah, but uh, the main thing is at this gallery. I heard there they have a really great cafe there. We can get a order of lamb pie. Have you ever had that? I've never had that. No. And then get some real Australian fish and chips. Ah. And, and uh, the Australian listeners are going, what's the big deal about lamb pie or fish and chips? We don't have no. it. <laughs> you know, uh, 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 what do you consider chips? We we call potato chips. Yeah. And most of the other world calls it crisp. I mean, we're still using miles, and everybody else is using metric oh, system. Oh, I know. Yeah, <laughs> you know, It'd be so much easier. I wouldn't have to read so many dang different numbers on this on the stats of the tanks. <laughs> and when, we just use the same thing as everybody the, else. When I was a kid, they actually tried yeah, to teach it. They now they don't. It. Yeah, they don't do it now. That was back in about what the mid seventies, early eighties that they tried to teach us the metric system, and I remember having the meter stick in the classroom but i don't i bet they don't even do that anymore no they i've talked to uh Man. some of the professors and teachers yeah they don't teach it over here yeah they don't even teach what how to like give your signature yeah. or what we called cursive writing they don't even teach it yeah so you're not teaching measurements you're not teaching how to sign your name yeah but but you can still play a basketball game and lose and still get a trophy because I know. everybody got a participation yep, trophy. Right. What? I don't want to comment. I, on. It's a rough can of worms to open up. But we got to go to this cafe and get some lamb pie. <laughs> and if you're ever in Kansas City, check out the World War One Museum and check out their little cafe with their crap on a shingle. Uh, yeah, and, yeah, and their trench hash. Their trench hash. You know, if we can ever trick... Craig Moore or uh, some of the guys coming over, we're yeah. going to take them there. Yeah, that was interesting. Get some food. Yeah, Charlie and food. <laughs> we suggest before hopping on an airplane to fly out there, you call the airlines and see what you need to travel to Brisbane. And, of course, contact the museum. Uh, we have found if you talk to them beforehand, they will show you stuff that you normally would probably miss. You know, and that's one of the things – since we're what we call keyboard historians. Yeah. You know, we would never claim to be real historians. Yeah. Now, we will claim to be keyboard yeah. historians. I tell you what, if I was a millionaire, I'd probably have my own degree tank and museum and absolutely be a historian. But the whole. But unfortunately, I have to still <laughs> work to live. 
<laughs> Russell still has to put on a badge and a gun oh. and go out there every day and deal with, well. The you, war on the streets, folks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's do our messages, shout outs, and then our Patreon stuff. Yeah, I've got one more thing. I kind of want to do a, a little segment on current news. Okay. To do with armored vehicles and tanks and that kind of stuff. Yeah. I'd Some like of the to stuff that. that's out there today that's going on that may pique some interest on on folks i got my new uh classic military vehicle magazine in the mail yesterday and doesn't craig write for them yeah he does he writes a few articles and oh awesome. very very interesting magazine i mean if you if you like printed magazines and that kind of stuff go out and search for them on the internet and subscribe to it It, it's it's awesome i just look at the pictures oh i know (laughs) oh and it does have some really neat pictures in it too but no i wanted to mention that in this particular magazine this month they uh talk about that the bae systems awarded life extension contract for the swiss cv90 combat vehicle wow one of their modern combat vehicles they're Actually, tracked vehicle, a recently announced life extension program for the Swiss Army's CV-9030 will keep the 186 vehicle fleet in service until 2040 and significantly improve the platform's ability in certain areas. So they're spending some money to keep that fleet going. Yeah, keep their fleet going. I don't think we've done episodes on that. No, we haven't. Have to put that on our list. All right. And, uh. But no, they're wanting to, there's a lot of improvements they want to do, uh, mainly in the areas of optical, electrical, and electronic components. Um, they also include the installation of active damping technology, which reduces wear and tear and minimizes long-term repair costs and improves speed and ride comfort. So give them a little bit more comfortable ride. And the other thing I want to mention too about the CV9030, several other European countries Actually, seven European countries use the use the CV90 as part of their armed forces. Armed forces, and that includes Denmark, Estonia, Finland, Norway, Sweden, and the Netherlands, um, with close to thirteen hundred vehicles in service in numerous variants. Oh, we got to do so, it. Yeah. We got to do an episode yeah, on we'll that. Put that on the list. And and, and and I, this is something I've been wanting to do for a little while. The news, you know, current news on. Uh, on what, some of the tanks and armored vehicles that are out there and and what's going on today. Well, this blatantly pl- plagiarized their magazine. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's why I shouted out. I, hey, It's an I, advertisement. Yeah, it is. It's an advertisement. And I, I shouted out to cite the source. So. Yeah. So I didn't steal it. Uh, yay. <laughs> That'll keep our lawyers happy. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's another good example yeah. of... Having something that works exactly, and maybe just needs yeah. better optics, some yeah. little improvements. Yeah. You don't have to scrap an entire program if you know it works. Exactly, yeah. And that many countries wouldn't be using it if it didn't work. So you know, we did that episode on the A10 uh, Warthog uh, tank killer aircraft, and how many times has that had to be defended? Yeah, by congress or you know yeah, congressmen exactly. and stuff like that where they've said listen we know the pilots yeah. this thing is still in use and doing amazing yeah, yeah. but you want to scrap it and start I, 50 uh, I know. 7 trillion dollar debt yeah you know it's ridiculous it is yeah we'll get on to our messages now um received a couple messages from some of our listeners always great to hear from antonio bernarda yep he uh, sent us a message with a link to a new movie, a new film. Oh, I've heard about this. They're coming out with a, a, adapting a World War II true story called Spearhead. Um, it's actually a book by Adam Mac- Macos, yeah. M-A-K-O-S. And I've actually read that. And it's amazing. It's, you know, about, you know, a gu- German gunner and stuff like that. An American gunner and uh, their harrowing uh, parallel journeys to Cologne, uh, a German fortress city where the Third Reich hoped to stop the Allied advance. You know, they're big battles there. Sure. Big tank stuff. You know what? I'd love to see that in a movie. Oh, I know. So we'll keep you up to date on that. Yes, yes. Now we got shout outs? We do. Still got several folks with us through our Patreon program. 
Yeah, we want to thank our patrons um, through our Patreon program. Um, Kim and Eric Shear, thanks, guys, for still being with us and your support. We got Riley. Yeah. Outstanding guy. Yes, yes. Uh, Razbaz18, still with us. Solid dude. Oh, he is. Antonio Bernarda. Thanks, Antonio. He's always helping us oh, out. Oh, I know. Uh, Slam Jamington. Alejandro Martinez. ODS Theron. And, of course, Rick Schmidt. Rick Schmidt. <laughs> we love Rick. Yeah. I mean, thanks you, thank you guys for your support. We promise to do our best to get some more content out there to our patrons. Um, we, we really need to do that. We've been slacking in that area, and we do apologize for that. But um, we lead a couple of busy lives here, and we're... We're trying. We really are. Yeah, With my book that I'm writing and you working 12-hour shifts, oh, man. it's really hard. Yeah. And you guys that are actually paying, yeah. you know, yeah. and helping us. Very much appreciated. And I, I promise we'll put that money to good use. And Yeah, we're won't actually be. thinking about finally getting a service called yeah. Ringer. Ringer. Um, so been we looking into that to where we can do some actual set down interviews sit down interviews on online and you know and hopefully pro- be my, my deal is with that the reason we haven't done that yet i've been looking for a decent service that's going to be pretty darn good quality audio i right. don't want to degrade our podcast by having some really crappy audio uh, on, exactly and yeah it just defeats people the purpose. will not listen yeah. if you got a bunch of echoes yeah and everything i know i quit listening to stuff like that when they you, like you said, echoes and it just, it's horrible. We're, we're, it just yeah. disturbs you to listen. Yeah. So we're going to check out Ringer. Yeah. And if we can get Ringer to work, we're yeah. going to do interviews with Craig. Yeah. Um, we're going to try to get Ed and yeah. uh, Francis Pullman. Okay. And we're, we're, we've got, well, we've a, got, we've got a whole list. Yeah. Yeah. We've got a whole list that we yes. want to. Yeah. But the, yeah. the list can almost be endless, to be honest with you. I mean, but we can, getting stuck out here in the bottom part of southeast oh, Kansas. Oh, man. We are out in the middle of nowhere. And, you know, and people are like, you know, I'd love to come see you guys and come out and have lunch. We we, we literally would have to meet you at the airport yeah. and party in Kansas City. And the City. closest, yeah, and the closest airport's in Kansas City or Tulsa, so... You probably know, cheaper to fly into Kansas City. If, but If you bring them to Parsons, Kansas... Oh. Yep. Not much to do here. Not <laughs> much to do. We we uh watch paint chip. Uh, forty years ago, forty, fifty years ago it was a booming town, but yeah. But that's coal mines. Yeah. Yep. And Parsons it was a railroad town too. So it's uh, guess we've we still could, got a railroad here and it's been pretty busy, but that's we could go show them it. some windmills. Hey, there you go. All right, pretty boring, but you oh, know, Lordy. but like in our towns like a big whirly gig going around and around in the middle of a pasture. Yeah. It was like that uh, <laughs> farmer, uh, he said, government come out and put all these fans out here to cool my cows, and they really didn't need it. I know. Oh, I forgot. And it's the end of the episode, so uh-huh. no one will hear it. Yeah. I got a joke. Oh, man. There we go. Hey, Russ, what kind of drug does a frog take? I have no idea. Croak cane. Oh, that's so bad. That's so bad. All right. Well, I guess that's the end of the episode. (laughs) That would be the end. I'm glad I (laughs) saved that for last. This is Charlie. And this is Russell. As always, happy tanking and have a great week.